Hello and welcome to the Dream Job Ready podcast and video series. My name is Dane Sharp, I'm the host, and my guest in this episode is Neil Ridgway, Chief Brand and Marketing Officer for global surfing company Rip Curl. Please note that the opinions of guests are their own and not those of the companies they have worked for. This is Dream Job Ready with Dane Sharp. G'day Neil, thanks so much for joining us on uh, what will be my first interview uh, on the Dream Job Ready podcast. Um, it's awesome to have you here, it's um, it's such a big thing to me. Um, you know, look at my career and, and the jobs I've had, you've played a pivotal role which we'll get into today and, and discuss, but um, um, you know, it's great to kick this off this way. I'd love you to kind of give us a quick 30 second, in a nutshell summary of what you do for you know, the famous Rip Curl. Thanks for having me Sharpie, it's good to see you here in Torquay too, back in your old stomping grounds. Um, I'm the Chief Brand and Marketing Officer at Rip Curl International and I'm pretty much responsible for everything in terms of advertising, promotion, um, outward facing brand, you know, pro team, ambas- ambassadors, retail look and feel, um, online look and feel, integrated merchandise and marketing campaigns, um, anything where the brand is outward facing to customers or to fans or surfers basically. Um, I'm responsible for, and it's it's a you know, it's a, a brand that's uh, over fifty years old now. You yourself have been with the business for seventeen years, which we'll mm-hmm. go through and discuss. I guess the different roles and iterations your your jobs yeah. had. Um, really quickly before we start working through some of that, um, you know, you're also responsible for teams and staff here. Do you want to give us a quick kind of rundown of, of what teams report into you and work with you? Um, well, I report into the executive, so I report to the group, uh, the CEO. Um, and there's an executive group of us that run the company um, across the world. Um, I have a global marketing unit here, creative director, art team. Um, I have pro team and events managers here, have digital marketing managers here, um, who all work out of headquarters to provide most of the content and most of the campaigns to the regions. I also have the regional marketing managers reporting into me on, you know, execution. So how they execute um, the vision for the brand in their territories, how they turn it up in one area rather than the other, how we keep them consistent with making sure they're spending the right amount on the right things and not yeah. spending not enough on others. So it's a pretty global role, and I work with the product teams closely on, you know, how product fits with brand. Um, I work with the product chairman the same way, who are the bosses of each division. Um, so it's a really good, wide open, open job. It's great. Awesome. So we've got a lot to discuss <clears throat> in it. Um, I was lucky enough to spend nine years here at the brand, uh, worked with you. And, and I guess, as I mentioned before, it was one of the key reasons I was hoping to get you on here is, um, as guest number one, you've played you know, a pivotal role, I guess, as a, as a boss in some of my dream jobs. Um, you've been a mentor to me, been a great mate, and I guess a key thing for me was you helped me get dream job ready in the first place as a teenager, which um, which, we'll, which we'll talk about a bit later. But um, before we dive into the the now, let's throw it back. Um, you know, teenage Neil Ridgeway. Um, what were you doing? Where were you growing up? What did, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, I'll start at you know, fifteen because yeah. I lived in Sydney before that, but I'd moved, my parents moved to the north coast of New South Wales, um, and. Uh, I was really getting into surfing at the time, but I'd had a long soccer background and I, I was lucky to get into an a invitational team at the time through playing soccer up there that took me away to Europe for three months to play soccer when I was um, 15. And um, it was great. I, I just wanted to be a professional soccer player, really, and before that. Um, and then I, I came home and I was 16 and I was 17 and I was surfing a lot. and Reality kicks in. Yeah, well, I was hanging around the beach, having a good time, you know. And I was still playing playing soccer and playing at a pretty good level, um, playing senior soccer. and But it never manifested that I went chasing a pro soccer career. Yeah. And then I was just right into surfing by then. And, um, uh, I mean, I wanted... I. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I think that's important for everyone. I know it's a young audience. Don't be too worried about not knowing what you want to do when you're young because you'll work it out eventually. And, you know, you've got a good eight years, I reckon, from the time you're 17 to 25 
to um, obviously a lot of people start earlier, um, but to sort of work out, you know, what it is you you think you might want to do with your life in a career sense anyway, mm -hmm. which is different to what you might want to do with your life in a personal sense. Oh, 100%. And, and mm -hmm. you know, I know for myself, what I ended up doing was so different than what I mm -hmm. wanted to do. Like, like you, uh, you know, dreams of being a, a pro sports person. And um, unfortunately, that didn't work out. And my next best thing I could think of was working in sports. So I mm -hmm. wanted to be a physio. Um, mm -hmm. And then the realities of the score I needed at uni and the amount of work mm -hmm. I had to do and you know, dabbling in some work experience that I mm -hmm. guess showed the non-glossy side of, of uh, physiotherapy. Um, reality check that. Um, mm -hmm. So I think you're right. You're like, you don't always need to know what you're going to do. And even if you do think you know, it might change. Like, do you, do you remember, can you think back to any kind of career advice you got, good, bad, or ugly, from any people when at the time? When I was that young? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Maybe that came from my father, um, big time. Like, yeah. he was a floor and wall tiler. And I used to do a lot of labouring with him and my uncle. And I always had a really good time with them on building sites and doing it. And it was good money you know when you're 17 18 in between studying i was at at college in lismore at that stage and working with him and i'd say look listen just teach me just teach me to be a tiler i'm i'm mixing the cement i'm doing the grouting i'm carrying the boxes i'm doing all just teach me and my father would never teach me he would say no i'm not teaching you there's there's something better for you mm -hmm. which is great career advice and he would Put things beside my bed like film and television school or, um, you know, writing or journalism or just things that I at the time took no notice of. I was like, what do you, you keep putting this stuff in front of me for? He goes, well, I can see in you that there's something different. And so he, he just refused to teach me. So, um, but along the way, what he did teach me while I was labouring with him was a work ethic which is really good career advice, that you have to be there. You can play as hard as you like at night time, but you be there ready for work when the siren sounds in the morning. It doesn't matter what your job is. And you be there in capacity to work and do what you got to do. If you can get the balance right, um, you'll, always, you'll always have a job. You'll always get asked back, which was... The career advice he gave me. Yeah. So something you've carried on. I remember you tell me early days at Ripco, you know, last person in the bar is okay as long as you're the first person in the door the next morning. So yeah, um, stay true to it. You can't, you can't let you let people down. Yeah, and, and so some of yourself. that, some of that early, um, you know, even if it was sort of a subliminal kind of guidance, uh, obviously played a some level of factor because you went and did a diploma in sports science. Yeah, uh, and then additionally after that went to the Uni of Newcastle and did a Bachelor of Arts communications mm. degree, right? So obviously that started mm. filtering through and, um, you know, was that side of school, I guess, especially the, um, the second, you know, the, the university degree, writing, cultural studies, media, was that an interest early or just one that sort of developed? Well, it's like I said, it takes you a long time and life's a funny thing to work out how you might end up where you are. Um, I'd been travelling overseas and I came back, I was working in, I'd worked for quite a while in the Snowy Mountains and again I worked in hard labouring jobs on an explosives crew and building, um, building ski lifts and things like that and that was again where I learnt about having a good work ethic and having to pull your weight in a team because if you didn't do, it, do that someone could get hurt or, you know, so it was a, that was really good for me and I'd gone overseas and travelled and I came back and it was a year later and I was driving back into Jindabyne to the same job and I was just like, what have I done? You know, why am I, why am I back here after all the things I've just seen around the world? And I went, I've got, to get, I've got to get my shit together. And I was probably 22 or something like that, I think. Um, maybe a bit older than that. Maybe, I'm not, I can't really remember. Um, and so I thought, oh, well, I'll be a PE teacher. And my brother was at Newcastle University and I rang him up and said, yeah, I've got a sports uh, science diploma and I'm a mature age student. And they went, well, no, you can't get into PE teaching. And I said, well, what can I get into? This was like 88 or 89 or something. So I guess it was a bit easier back then. And they said, oh, well, you know, journalism, communications. And um, I'd all, always written a good letter I thought and always told it spun a good yarn in the pub so perfect I thought yeah that sounds like a pretty good idea I'll give that a whirl and um I majored in writing and research and minored in photography and I pretty quickly 
as a mature age student, worked out that I was in the right place. Yeah. That it was, I, I wanted to be a writer and I, wa- and I felt I could be a journalist and it was, an, it was a good profession and a good profession for me. So it's a bad roundabout way to get there. But when I got there as a mature age student, it was very clear to me. And I wouldn't say I was the best student then either because, you know, uni's, uni's uni, you can, you can make of it what you want, but I was much more focused than I was the first time around because I knew why I was there. Yeah. And, and, and I'd imagine a big part of that is because you had to had a chance to expo- uh, be exposed to a lot of different stuff as well. You know, even at mm. uni you get a taste of a lot of different things, which probably helps you wipe off some stuff that you, yeah. you are interested in as well. Um, talk about, um, you know, obviously in your role here you see a lot of new starters and young starters mm. coming into to Rip Curl, um, you know, same as I do mm. at, at Groupon and in previous mm. roles. And a lot of those um, you know, new starters come in and say they want to work in marketing or in media mm. or in advertising, but also will, you know, will kind of you know, give you the truth that they don't really know what they want to do, but they think that's it. You know, what advice do you give those people or would you give those people and, and would you accept them in a role if they're fit and help them kind of work out what they want to do? Or, or yeah. How do you say? I think you should take... Um, you shouldn't be afraid to take opportunities that might not be the ones that you want at the time particularly if it's to get you into a place, a um, place like Rip Curls. Um, there's a lot of young people and they, they're they generally entrepreneurial and have, they've got their own ideas. And um, if they're any good and they've got a good, strong work ethic, they can focus. They they apply themselves to what the brand values are, mm-hmm. not not their own values. That's the biggest mistake is to is to come in and go, well, I think I know what this place is about, but I think it should actually be about this. Guarantee you no one's bigger than the brand. doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're Doug Warbrick and Brian Singer who started the place. Nobody's bigger than the brand. The brand has values and the brand has a vision and the brand has direction. And if you want to be part of that in an organisation that you get into, you will eventually find the right job. Yeah, you might start in a job that is not right for you because, like you said, sometimes the young people don't know where they want to be or but they, they kind of know what, where they, what they love and what they think they're good at. It's not about you. Unless you want to work for yourself and make it all about you, which is good too, if you can find a way to do that and create your own thing with, with a vision, when you become part of an organisation... You actually have to work as part of the organisation. Yeah. That's oh, a really yeah. important thing to understand. If you can understand that early, the blinkers will be off. You'll be you'll be able to be creative. You'll be free. You'll 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 work really well. Um, you'll get other opportunities because you're doing all of those great things that you want to do, but you're marching in the right direction. And you're learning as well, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I think that's a big part of it. Is it's hard in, in in today's society, and you look at you know some of the other podcasts that are out there that are driving people to be an entrepreneur mm. and start their own business, and that is great for a lot of people. But the value that you can get along the way, or at the start, or even you know, as you're doing it, to see how a big company works or how mm. people within a big company works mm. is is crucial. And I think it's a very good point, just being able to kind of. Um, you know, flip that switch and kind of understand that I've got my own initiatives and I've got my own um, goals here, mm. but they have to be equal to and, and, and support, mm. I guess, the overarching ones. How, how do you help? How do you help foster that understanding? I suppose because there's, you know, it's, it's not an immediate light switch for some yeah. people. I'm like, how do you help encourage that kind of thinking or behaviour for some people that don't? I'm like a broken record <laughs> on, on on vision and values yeah. for Rip Curl. Um, I, that's a big part of my wherever I go around the Rip Curl group, I have to talk about hey everybody you know is the vision is the values what are they what are, how do you use them because once you i encourage that in those people because once they know them i really can't say no to them sure like if you come to me with an idea and you want funding and you want to do something and i go okay what does it match up with any of the brand values and if you go yeah well it talks to the search or it talks to leadership or it talks to technology or it talk, you go okay all right, what's the next stage? But if you turn up and go, I've got this great idea and it's about X, Y, and Z and it's got nothing to do with Rip Curl, it's probably still a great idea, but it's not for, it's not for us. Mm. So 
being consistent in helping people to understand those are the parameters for them to work in once they they understand that they can be as creative as they want and it's a real asset a lot of places will give you a handbook or vision and people just chuck them in the desk that does not happen at rip curl mm-hmm. we, we really believe in that stuff um, because it keeps everybody going in the same direction it doesn't mean that there's not room for individual creativity 100 percent there is but it's working towards the common common goal and, and yeah and such a um important lesson because the same people if they do go on to have their own business that's mm. as big or bigger or, or even smaller um they'll probably you know negate the necessities of having that kind of vision mm. and brand values for the people that come and work for them right so hard to learn probably the start but mm. important onwards um all right so we, we're back at uni uh, you're having a great time by yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, learning some time. stuff etc um <laughs> were you working at the time or what was your first uh, what was your first dabble of work in the professional sense out of uni um I was still at uni and I started, uh, I did a work experience stint at Track Surfing Magazine Mm -hmm. and um, I loved it and it was in Crown Street in Darlinghurst at the time and Choco Dunn was there and Reggae Ellis and Nick Carroll and um, Tim Baker and um, when I left there was this travel columnist called Daryl Davenport and he hadn't written it was always one of my favourite columns to read and he hadn't answered for two or three months and I'd be asking him oh what's what's wrong with Daryl oh you know he's off in Patagonia or somewhere (laughs) oh that sounds about right anyway one day over a beer in the tradesman's arms after work they were like it doesn't exist (laughs) yeah Yeah, right (laughs) dream job (laughs) it's us so it was a time where it was pre-internet so people actually wrote pages files of letters in i want to know about surfing here i want to know about surfing there so you'd answer their questions and it'd be it was one of the most popular columns so i said all right well how about i be daryl i went back to uni and that was in my first year or something and um probably blown the lid off this for everybody now but um that's great the um, the guy that you looked at that had the dream job but didn't exist and then you got it yeah it was like that so so then i became a columnist and then i was a free another freelance work came my way and I never said no to anything that they said. You want to write, we need you to write this. Yep, no worries. Mm. I'll write it. Like, and took every every opportunity I could. And then um, eventually I ended up getting a job there as the deputy editor when I still had six months to go on my degree. And they, um, they said that the uni was unreal at Newcastle. They were like, I had a, a really great lecturer there, Lynette Burns, who'd come out of newspaper journalism before she was a lecturer and she had helped me with a lot of advice and about writing and tone and where you come from and she was like I'll make it happen so they let me um do uni you know one day a week yeah for six months and yeah. I had to do some video tutorials and crap like that yeah, but yeah have that, to is, that's so similar to me mate like I, I don't know if you remember I'm sure I told you at the time yeah. but I think we first met and we'll get into it later um 1999, I think, so I was in, in finishing the second year of my uni, uh, and I had been sort of given the advice to kind of get out there and try some work experience, and I, I remember when we met, um, I think I was 19, and you were teaching my, uh, uh, my mum was teaching your oldest daughter at the yep. time, right, and she told me that, oh, there's this guy at, um, at the school, he's got a daughter, and He's a journalist, he writes for mm. some kind of magazine. Uh, I don't think she knew the type of magazine you mm. worked for, work we'll get there in a sec. Um, but, you know, maybe he's got some advice, and I was a bit iffy, as you are, you know, you're sort of, oh, I'm sure he won't be able to help mm. me, and he probably won't be bothered by me, etc. Um, but I had a couple of different lecturers that were big on the practical side of uni, mm. and if you can go out and do some work mm. experience, do it. Um, so we met uh, in your house in Thoreau, yep. I think it was. Um, you worked for FHM. Yeah. At the time, right? You were the launch editor of FHM magazine, yeah. uh, which was a phenomenon back in the day, mm. um, a huge mag. And it's hard to probably put it in context now, but um, <laughs> yeah, people wouldn't understand. But you know, it was like the GQ <laughs> online, or it was like um, yeah, the equivalent to working probably for you know Instagram or TikTok in, in size yeah. at the point. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I didn't even know the mag as a as a late teenager, and I looked at it and I went, "Holy dooly, this this looks all right." Mm. Because you talk about it's what women, mm. sport drinking and having fashion, fun, right? yeah, uh, bit of career, fashion bit of career advice bit of investment advice bit of health advice yeah, had everything. a very strict flat plan of what what you couldn't make it all about any one thing yeah. it had a very strong 
brand DNA yeah. and you fill those holes every yeah. month. So we got to talk about that because that's a dream job in itself. But So you showed me this. I've gone like, wow. I think you showed me something like a Smash Hits music mag or something as well at the time, a bit, bit of a younger, young generation. Yeah. And, um, and you were kind of like, yeah, do you want to do some work experience? And I was kind of like, yeah, being told the same thing, say yes to anything. So I was like, hell yeah. Um, and uh, I think a couple of weeks later, you had me up at... Um, up there at the magazine and it was an eye opener for me for a couple of reasons so um what one of the things i, I was interested in was um how hard journalists work for starters not an easy job right mm. like bust your ass you know work hard deadlines all that kind of stuff but the immediate thing for me and the, the immediate um urgency that i saw around hey this guy's got a dream job i remember you had roll you had a roller deck uh, back in there which had people like El McPherson, and Kylie Minogue, Pamela Anderson names in there. Um, you had you know, pictures of the wall, signatures of sports stars, etc. And I looked at it and went, wow, this is a dream job. Um, before I rattle on about that, you know, what do you remember about FHM and the opportunity you had at that back? Yeah, I don't remember any of them being in the roller <laughs> decks, I know that much. But no, there, there was might a, have been, there, there there might have been so names the first like shoot, the first, One of the first shoots I went to was Kylie Minogue shoot. When I was learning, I was having an induction in London at FHM and I went to one of her shoots. And that was an eye opener for me too. It was just like you come out of tracks and it's you know it's a twenty thousand dollar budget for the whole magazine, and you go to somewhere like FHM and it's they can drop fifty grand on a set of photos to fill you know five pages because the thing was selling you know millions of copies around the world and getting huge advertising rates at the time, and um, it's it's a you know it was a men's magazine. Um, and it wouldn't, couldn't exist in the world today the way it is, and you would never try to explain the good things about it in the world today because I think the uh, argument would be too hard to have with with most people. But, um, you know, what I will say about that is that there's a professional exchange in all kinds of work you there's something in every deal for both parties there's something in in that magazine if you look at who's on the, was on the cover whether it was Kylie whether it was Shania Twain whether it was Catherine Zeta Jones whether it was Dr Katrina Warren whether it was the Hockey Roos whether it was you know it didn't matter there was never any cash chain exchanged hands but what there was for the talent was exposure yeah. and a place to have an interview that they could vet 100%, they could see every photo. If they didn't want to run it, they didn't want to... It was like an open. So it taught me a lot about negotiation and fair play in negotiation. And you'll find yourself in negotiations in your career where when you do a lot of them, sometimes sometimes you you have to remember that there has to be a fair a fair outcome for both parties because you can get on a roll where it's fair for you but it ain't fair for anyone else mm. you know and that's a win because there's more for you or there's more for your company or there's more for whatever that's bullshit in the end of the day mm. as you get older and you go through it you go well what am i going to be remembered for no one's going to remember me for screwing them down you know but if you can over a long period of time Negotiate with your boss, negotiate with your colleagues, negotiate with your suppliers, negotiate with your talent, negotiate with your lecturers. You know, you might be late for an assignment. You can't get it in. I know the audiences, there's a lot of students. There's always a negotiation as to why you should get an extension. If you're fair and honest about it, well, mm. you'll probably get it. Mm. If, you, if you then live up to your side of the bargain and the lecturer thinks that's fair, well, that's a good place to start. Yeah. I mean, it's a little bit odd because people think we paid all those people in that. We didn't have paid anyone a cent. Yeah, yeah. It was about publicity and exposure and it was huge. Yeah. Like there were literally millions of copies. And <coughs> honesty and transparency obviously yeah. key too, right? Doing yeah. that. And, and you know, for you, I guess this is probably a, it's a great thing uh, as you're starting out in your career and you're meeting you know, uh, people that are in more superior roles than you or high profile mm. people or famous people. Um, you know, that's that's probably something you had to learn as well going on. I, I guess um, you know, talk to me a bit about that. You know, the the opportunity you had to kind of start getting in the room with some of those people, um, mm. probably learning from some of your own mistakes, but also picking up what other people do. Because mm. you you know you're great at meeting, you're great at negotiation, but 
it doesn't always happen overnight for some people, mm. introverts, extroverts, so yeah. everyone's a bit different. Um, yeah. Talk about, you know, how that probably opened up the door to meeting some of those high profile people and yeah. heroes and all that kind of stuff. And I, I never really worried too much about who I wanted to meet. Yep. You know, like, it's really the role that you're in, all people are, you know, there's good and bad in everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, high-profile people have a lot of people hanging off them and you don't want to be someone hanging off them. Yeah. And if you're in front of them, you don't want to waste their time and if you're going to work with them, you want to work professionally and get out. And you know what? They'll remember you well that way and it's like anything in life. You can't be friends with everybody. Mm-hmm. Like... Some of those people that I've met, if I see them, I'm still, hey, how you going? What's happening? And they, we know each other. And some of them, um, you know, I would say I'm friends with, but mostly it's just having a professional courtesy and a respect for the for the job. And if you get that in your head before you go into that situation, you won't be overawed. Mm. Like you, it's some people you're like, wow, that you know. I can't believe this, you know. Like, I remember at the Clio, we were at the Cosmo Woman of the Year not long ago, and I was sat opposite Julia Gillard, and I what I like, I had, Julie, I had Julia Gillard there. I had the yellow wiggle there. I had, you know, um, Samantha Armitage there. I, I was the Cosmo Woman of the Year, right? It was all these great women from around Australia that. In, from different things and it was like me and two other blokes it was the best best thing <laughs> and I was lo- looking at Julia Gillard and we just started everybody sort of went between courses and it was just me and her and um, so we just started talking about how you going you know talking about footy and she's a Bulldogs fan I'm a Cats fan and so we took we just talked about the normal stuff and once that happened and it was quite comfortable then it, there was you talk about some of the other issues of the day um but i guess that's part of being a journalist mm. is if this is for journalism students don't be the story mm. you know there's a whole there's a whole school of gonzo journalism where you are the story but you know what that's not journalism mm. it, it's really not so look at the greats of that type of stuff look at you know parkinson and andrew denton yeah. and you know, they rarely talk about themselves unless the other person talks about them and their experience relates. So it's making other people, you know, feel like they're important in that in that respect. Um, you, you will eat a lot of shit yeah. along the way, I tell you, and you'll have to eat a lot of shit with a smile on your face mm-hmm. if you want to get... Because some people will deal you out a lot of shit. Yeah. But particularly in long relationships where, you know, that where, you, where you're feeling each other out and, you know, long ones, I think I think probably that you talk about, I don't know if we're at highs and lows or no, I'll shut up if you yeah, like, but, no. you know, the, for me, if I think back of the re- on the really things that have meant a lot to me, the relationship I have with Mick Fanning yep. and the development of his career and, you know, the has been really um like you know that was that was pretty important career um thing for me it went from someone i didn't really know and someone who didn't really like me who was young and brash and didn't know who he was or where he was going to be and what he wanted to do and worked out a way to help him live up to his potential and for him to teach me along the way how to live up to my potential to be better Mm -hmm. and change the way I work and change the way I think about things, like in reverse, basically, um, was a really good... You don't get that in your life, in your working life very often where you can truly say, you know, we've influenced each other and we've achieved really good things yeah. and genuinely he probably would have three world titles without us but but maybe not in the way he's, he's done it and how he's developed and I, I think that's really important yeah so the relationship with Mick one of the yeah defining yeah. kind of moments yeah. yeah yeah for sure and what was the critical stuff you had to learn along the way in that relationship you know because nobody's perfect we're all learning stuff like what was some of the stuff that smacked you in the face and went, well I need to get better at that or um, do that I, differently or whatever. 
I, I, I had to learn to see it, like I was talking about negotiations and being fair. Yeah. Like, you can go, well, I write the check. You put those board shorts on, mate. I don't care if you don't <laughs> like them. What do I care? You wear them. Wear the sponsor. Don't, you know. I had to learn. Mick, Mick's been, was great for me because he rebelled against that. Mm-hmm. And I had to work out why he was rebelling against it. And it coincided with the fact that he was a special talent on the way to the top. Mm-hmm. And he knew at some point, he knew that he was more valuable and that he had earned the right to say, hey, that's, I'm not a junior. I'm not, you know, I was being in the extreme about, you know, put that on. And, yeah. But he earned the right to say, no, well, I don't think we should do it that way. I think we should do it another way. Yeah. And so... I had to learn to go, take a deep breath, go back to the other side of the table, come back to the table and go, all right, well, how, what is the best way? Mm-hmm. And then it's a partnership and then it works and then it's fair for everyone and, and that his ideas were really good and you had to work a way to bring them into that framework I was talking about before. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I just changed the way that I worked because of that and I was I have a much better view of the partnership of what you can achieve with someone because of that and if he did not stood up and said no bullshit I'm not doing that I would never have had to learn to deal that way that's awesome. And I think that yeah, there's a lot in, in it from his side as well, which I think is great advice. Obviously, not everyone's going to grow up to be Mick Fanning and in that professional sense. But um, I guess you, you mentioned, you know, as, as probably he got the data or the experience or, or the reason to challenge some of those things, challenge authority or you know, mm. my boss in some sense, is it probably an important thing itself. You know, when you start a new, new role, first, second year mm. in, you're trying to prove yourself. Yep. Um, you might have an idea that you think is going to float. It's hard to get that across sometimes to mm-hmm. a manager or you know, a manager's manager etc um you know i think you talked about it a, a bit earlier here if, if someone brings it back to those values at, at um at rib curl mm-hmm. you're more likely to let it you know air out and potentially mm-hmm. succeed you know talk about probably any advice you can give on on a new starter um you know someone young in their career about building that experience or the data or just having the you know I guess being a journalist, you're actually working out what the story mm. is before mm. putting it out there for someone to say yes or no to yeah. doing that. Uh, it's a place of work, right? And you've got as much right as anybody else sitting in a chair in that place to have a good career ahead of you and to use everything that's available in that organisation to your best of your ability. Mm. I think a lot of young people feel they're so far down the tree or they're like, I shouldn't say anything or... Mm. That's natural. Some people are different, right? Just when I say stuff like, you know, never, you know, don't be late, be the last in the bar at the first at work, they're extreme statements, right? But they're just, you're just making a point. Yeah. Be reliable. Ask questions. Ask questions. Don't, don't be afraid to, in a, in a calm way, go, you've sent me a job. A task I don't know how to do it I'm gonna make it up and fuck it up or, I'll, or I'm gonna ask you how not to fuck it up and finish it right the first time yeah and it doesn't matter how big or how small people will appreciate that so that that would be one piece of advice again in the extreme I say never say no to anything oh, yeah. that's bullshit yeah look at the opportunities that suit you when they come their way outside of what you usually do, you put your hand up for it and deliver it, you get asked again. Sure. You put your hand up for it again and you deliver it, you get asked again. Doesn't mean that you'll be taken advantage of it, means that when the next opportunity comes that's better, they'll go, well, give it to that person. Yeah. Because the people who have run away from anything that's additional, you kind of go, well, they're not going to, why would I give it to them? This person's really keen. Mm. So be keen, ask questions, take your opportunities, but then you get to negotiate for yourself. Have a strong sense of your own worth along the way. You'll know if you're doing good work. You'll know if you're doing a good job. If you're doing a good job and you want, you are then in a place 
to say to your manager, hey, I think I'm doing a good job in your appraisal, in whatever. You can ask for more. You can ask for more and then you can negotiate. And I had a great, you talk about mentors, I had a great mentor called Andrew Cow, mm -hmm. who was the editorial director at Mason Stewart Publishing and EMAP. He was Ida Butros' art director when, you know, Cleo started. He was one of Kerry Packer's guys, you know, like back when magazines and print was was big. Yeah. And he was he was very good for me in that. He gave me a lot of opportunity because he, he actually believed in me because I, I don't know why, but he did. Yeah. Um, and when he offered me something, I said yes for a number of times and then about the third time I said, yeah, well, that's going to cost this much. Yeah. Because it was freelance because yeah. I had a bit of a track record and a position. He goes, oh, well, okay. <laughs> what about this? Because he's never going to offer it to you, right? Yeah. But he's prepared to pay it because he knows he's getting a good job. Yeah. And so along the way, I, you've got to learn to... You don't get a pay rise just because you want one. Sure. You get a pay what rise you because you do a good job and there's an opportunity in the, in the company for you to advance. One, it's a disappointing thing to say. But some people can be in companies for 20 years and never get anything more than 3%. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean they haven't done a good job. Mm -hmm. It's because the job is the job. Mm -hmm. You know, the jobs, that's the job. Yeah. I, I've never, I've walked through every open door that ever came my way. When I was the editor of Tracks, I didn't want to not be the editor of Tracks, but they said, why don't you edit this FHM thing? I went, what? I'm not going to do that. And then I had a look at it and I went, oh, well, it's an opportunity. So I went, yeah. led to the next thing. Yeah. And I was quite happy doing FHM and it was firing. It was making a huge yeah. amount of money. And then an opportunity came to be the publisher and I was like, not a writer anymore. That was the defining. And when you move into, you've got to be careful what you wish for. So mm -hmm. I went from being a writer and a journalist then to manager and business side. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure. I don't think I thought too much about that at the time, but it had an impact on my career. I wasn't a writer anymore. Um, but I did it, and it led to the next job. And then because I had Rip Curl as a client because of that, here I am 20 years, 17 years down the track at, at Rip Curl. Um, you know, I'm 55, I surfed the, today, I surfed the wave pool yesterday. Yeah. Like it's, I'm Dream lucky. Dream job, mate, that's I'm pretty, why I'm here. pretty lucky. Yeah. Um, wouldn't say I surfed it very well, but I, I surfed it. <laughs> But you know what I mean? Like, you can, you can go through the... You've also got to understand that you might make the wrong decision. Yeah. And that's okay too. That, do not worry about it. The, the, the best thing about make, making a decision is if you get it wrong, you just make another decision. Yeah, put it back on the track. And put it back on track. If you never make a decision... I never do it. You can, you can fix stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's only work. Yeah. Like that. It's just, that's the thing that sticks with me most now. Um, despite me telling everyone to work their ass off in, their, yeah. in this podcast, is, is it's just a job. And you got to have fun, right? Yeah. Got to have fun. Got to be happy. Yeah. Got to enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got to have balance, you know. You, yeah. You'll have lots of times of imbalance, particularly as you go through your, from 20 to 30 and 30 to 40 and you're working really, really hard and you've got a family on the go or, or not, you know. In my case, I do and I did and I did exactly what I'm telling you guys to do, just fucking keep going. And I put the work, work ahead of that. Uh, I don't regret it, but I reckon there's times when I should have had more balance and thought more about other parts of my life than just work. Yeah. Try to try because once you once you realise that can you can be a bit it can be too late. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's my experience, but there is at the end of the day, right? It's a job. Yeah. 100%. It's not the only thing in your life. Yeah. Uh, yeah well, well, I mean, just like. Let me riff off that for a sec. You know, the, one of the perks of your dream job and, and a couple you had before is, is travel, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's 
traveling to some of the most beautiful countries in the world, be- mm. beautiful beaches with Rip Curl in particular. Um, but that also puts a level of demand and stress on not only yourself, but also your family, you know, your mm. wife in your case, your kids, etc. Yeah. Um, just talk about, I guess, the, the realities of, of both the amazingness that is something like mm. global travel in mm. a role and, and one of those calling cards for people, mm. but then also the, the fact that um, it is a job under that and you've still got to pack your bags, mm. leave family, etc. Mm. Yeah, it's great. The travels, if, if you like traveling and you find yourself in a job where you can travel, it's great. I've always been a traveler. I don't really care where I'm going. I just like going. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, so I never said no, but I had different bosses, you know, about five CEOs here at Rip Curl. One boss would say to me, you've got to stay away, for go for that two weeks. And there's another two weeks at, over here. Why don't you fill in the two weeks in the middle somewhere else and save some money? I go, okay, boss. Like, you know, I'd only been, I hadn't been here long and so I'd be away for six weeks. That's ridiculous. Yeah, amazing. It's just, no, it's stupid. Stupid. <laughs> it's stupid yeah. because, because you how you're just completely neglecting everything thing else in your life yeah. that's just stupid and in in corporations companies businesses whatever it is that you you be that nobody nobody should be should have to do that if you're single and you're out and you and you're happy with that great yeah. but you've got to have no one ex, no one expects you to give blood mm-hmm you know, it's a... Feels like you it might, sometimes. But yeah. You f- and you'll feel... Sometimes you'll feel like you'll be so proud of what you achieved that you don't mind giving the yeah. blood. You know, I used to be like that on deadlines and mags and working my ass off. And yeah. I loved it. I'm not complaining yeah, about it. I made the choices. I loved it. I loved, you know, magazines were... In those days, I, in Sydney, were a pretty wild place to be, you know, like that... That culture, I, I like that journalism pub thing. I can't say it was. I can't say it was always the best decision, but I enjoyed it. But, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's um, people will ask more of you, and you should give as much as you can, and you should try to be the best that you can be. But try to have some balance, and the travel stuff is great. You know, it gets it gets old pretty quickly. Sitting in a hotel room on your own as you blokes all know you know after a while there's only if you're a week on assignment with the same people even though they're colleagues and friends you're eating with them again or then you're not because everyone's kind of had enough and you go back to your hotel room and then you're like well here I am you know like but it's great because the next day for us it's great at Ripco because we generally go somewhere we can have a surf every day which is what I really like, and you got to try to keep. And and because a company that likes to have a good time, so there's always a good time to be had at Rip Curl with Rip Curl people on the road. So again, I'm not complaining. It's great. It's unreal work, and you get exposed to all sorts of cultures and work cultures and free, real lot of freedom in your career when you get away from headquarters because it's a new, it's new energy and it's new work energy. All that stuff's really good, but just be aware that you should have balance. Yeah. And, just, and just really quickly on the travel part, you know, we're in a, we're in a very much smaller world these days, you know, the, the, the world's unlocked, the uh, travel you can do, the people you can meet, you know, even before you go mm. these days. You know, you've, you've got three kids of your own. Did you encourage them, um, whether you were specifically for their career or not, but to travel, to go yeah. to places, experience that kind of stuff? Yeah, our family motto is sleep when you're dead. Yeah, okay. You know, yeah. we're like... <laughs> Don't miss an opportunity, you know. Yeah. Um, and they've travelled a, a bit with me and they've travelled a bit on their own. And um, travels, are, I mean, I can't speak highly enough of the, what you learn by moving around the world. And this is a unique place, Rip Girl, for that. There's, you know, in many companies, you've got to sign in triplicate to get a domestic mm-hmm. airfare. Mm-hmm. If you can't work something out here after a couple of you go, you go. You get on a plane and you go and work it out because unless you're talking to each other and you're in front of each other, particularly when you're in manufacturing and marketing and it, there's a lot of money at stake, it's actually not a lot of money to spend on an airfare to get it right. Yeah. And when you're somewhere else, particularly in my role where it's wide-reaching, there's 
always a lot of work to do. Yeah. You know, there's always a lot of things you can do to capitalise on your time. And that would be another piece of advice. If you, if you are lucky enough to be able to do that in your job, don't fuck it up. Don't be complacent. Make sure that when you come back, the people there are saying good things to the people here. Mm. That was a real asset, having that person here. Mm. That was great. You know, we solve that issue. You follow up. You make sure you correspond with what, with what you said you're going to do. You'll, go, you'll be on the next plane before you know it. Yeah. You know, it's it's you're there for you're having a ball if along the way, but you're only there because you've got a job to do and you've got to add value. Yeah. And it's a bit like I was saying before about do whatever they. If you do it right, you'll get asked again. If you do it right, yeah. you're gonna. You, yeah, you're gonna make an impact, right? right? You gotta take advantage of that it's opportunity. Gotta be, gotta be valuable. Yeah. No, perfect. I, the, honestly, your um, one thing you instilled in me very early was that you know say yes to opportunities, and, and it was really interesting just you talking about. You know, in the early days, it does feel like oh, I'm just going to say yes to everything at start, and then maybe you, know, you get a little bit of rigor and a bit of experience to start navigating the yeses, etc. Um, and you know, it had so much effect on me throughout my career. You know, I even started a consultancy business for a year, which I called Why mm-hmm. Say No. Just yeah. to put that on the head because um, I think most of the time there's got to be a bloody good reason not to say not yes, to say right? Yes. And yeah. sometimes there is a good reason. Um, one of the things that I've got, to, I've got to show this. So I brought in one of the early FHMs <laughs> I would that you, have said no if I that was you were, right? This, and this has always stuck with me because, and, and you, you probably tell the story better than I do. But yeah, there was. This is my first day, I think it was, up in mm. this uh, Sydney, big Sydney. I was a Wollongong boy um, up there, you know, bamboozled by the the world of journalism and um, the professionalism slash unprofessionalism of it uh, in yeah. those days. And yeah. one of the first things, and you can tell the story if you want. One of the first things you asked mm. me to do, I think, was. Um, and I had long hair back then, I think. I had hair yeah. down to almost my shoulders, I reckon. Yeah. I've marked it here. Um, you were really quiet in those days too. You was I? Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You were, you well behaved. You weren't uh, as... Well, you were young. True. And I think you said to me, how do you like your hair? <laughs> and I think an you know, 18-year-old guy, I loved my hair at the time, yeah. was, the, was the future. Yeah, you did look like you loved your hair. One of the... But, um, and you were like, I think we need to shave it. And I was like, what are you talking about? And you're like, oh, I'm going to put you in a photo shoot. This is a grooming feature. <laughs> and so it's about haircuts. Yeah. You sent me to a pub down the road in Haymarket, I think it yeah, was. Or... There's, a pub in, um, there's a pub in George Street and you can order, or you could order a beer and sit there with a beer and get your hair cut at the yeah. same time. So we ran the clippers straight down the middle of your head. Straight down my head. Much to my mother's disgust at the and, time, let alone mine. Yeah, so that was, but that was good, chap. Because you know what, you um, you did what was required, and everybody that was the photo editor, yeah, Liz Sheriff, and she was like, yeah, like so you. And I took that from you. Did it? I honestly, I took it like the, you know, it's a funny thing, and, and I you still came back, right? Yeah, that was the, I think you said to me at the time, you know, you just got to say yes to that kind of yeah. stuff, and not everything is is getting head shaved like, like that. beer at yeah. lunch. But um, yeah, yeah something that really st- stuck to me, and I think um. Yeah, the, the biggest learn from that for me is is also not only just I guess saying yes to that opportunity, but putting yourself out there into that opportunity. Mm. And I know everyone's different, and there's different mm. makes up makeups and mm. personalities of people. But um, you know, if you can talk to me even with your, your own kids, here's an example, or other people you see here as well, is how do you sort of help people? I guess ex- explore the opportunity to get that opportunity in the first place. You know, get out there, and, and people ask all the time: Is it networking? Is it befriending mm. people on or connecting with people on LinkedIn? Mm. Is it showing up at the front desk yeah. and saying, oh, "I want a job"? Like, talk to me about that. How would you advise people on that? I um, persevere. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot more ways to connect with people now than there there was before which can be an advantage or a disadvantage because you just get so much stuff everybody gets so much stuff right but if you're interested where you want to be got an idea of what it is that you want to do you should write whether it's email whether it's by a letter whether it's by you know it's so funny these days like you know contacting people on a message through Instagram or Facebook is you almost think well that's a bit personal but actually no channel is personal now every channel's just a channel yeah, um, and a way to communicate. So there's a lot of ways to get a hold of people. But it's really about saying things in the right way, you know, about yourself and the opportunity that 
you might want to create for yourself and why someone should take the time to have a yarn to you, you know, and, and most people will, I think. I don't think there's, I think anyone who is in a management role that, particularly I've been lucky because I've employed a lot of young people over the years, lots, mm -hmm. and still am, and it's like, I'm lucky because it, it keeps you um, grounded yeah. quite well because they don't take much bullshit from anyone, <laughs> yourself included. Um, but you can be fair and uh, together in that. But just get it. Don't don't give up. Um, that's a cliche. Just find the right way to present yourself. And when you get the chance, lay it out. Yep. You know, and then if you get work experience, in my mind, it's the best. I've, I've employed, so, like you, like mm -hmm. Adam Blakey, like, like, God, his brother Ronnie, like, I could tell you the list forever. Yeah. Um, of people who, and there's equally a, li a list that's three times as long of work experience people who just came out an opportunity, did nothing, and you'll never see them again. Yeah. But the people who get a chance, if you get a chance to get your foot in the door, give it your best shot. Have a crack. Have a crack, keep, and then stay in touch. And like you say, you don't have to go to the extreme of getting your head shaved for FHM, but, you know, if they're going down the pub for a beer or they're going to go and have some lunch or yeah. just connect, try to connect with the people when you're in there and you know you should you should then be able to stay connected to them yeah it's, it's great advice and I think you know, I even remember your early work experience you're nervous because you, you don't know anything but yeah. I guess that's almost the beauty and the person at the other side that's managing you or looking after you for the day they kind of realise you don't know anything mm. but it's all those other ways you can make an impression yeah. right just being vocal asking questions to your mm. point you know being open to go and get lunch as opposed to oh, I'll just go do my own thing. Yeah. I don't you. And no one, no one knows everything. Anyway. Anyway, like I'm, Katmandu just bought Rip Curl. I'm in a, after 17 years here, I'm like, I'm pretty, like it's like you're only as good as your last day again. Mm -hmm. You've actually got to prove to people again why you should be in the job, why you do a good job, why, how do you connect with people again? It's, um, it's like starting over. That happens all the way through your work and life. And is that, what, is that one of the things, is that one of the crucial things that's, I guess, kept you in this role for 17 years? Because I guess in some respect, you know, it is such a dream job. So people are going to be like, why would you ever leave? Yeah. Uh, and I've got people on me all the time about how stupid I was to leave. Yeah. So I guess there is that. But then, in, you know, it's the, in the modern society, people do change jobs and change positions. Yeah. And you've changed positions in the role. How have you, what's kept you energised and kept you thinking this is the, exactly the job I want to do? Well, rib curl at surfing. Yeah. Um, B, I'm an advertising man. Yeah. C, I'm a writer and a journo. So the career, the career suits me. I like. That's what I do for a profession, right? So, it'd want to be a pretty good opportunity for me to walk away from this one because it's got all those things you talk about: travel and yeah. surfing and exposure to, like, exposure to people like Medina and Tyler Wright and and Mick and you know. All, Plus all the people that I work with in the company who are along, who are generally either surfers or snowboarders or like-minded people who like the beach. And mm -hmm. but but my I've been lucky because I've walked through those doors every opportunity. My job title hasn't changed in Ripcord, but the jobs changed five times sure. in seventeen years. You know, for blocks of three years. So um, can't don't don't jump around. Like, it's a long game. Yep. Medium, you know, brands are medium to long-term place. Long-term, nothing happens quickly. Campaigns, ideas, they come and go. Yep. True, same with your career when you're building your career. I think three years is a good time. You get a job and it's one you want. you got a, you got a year to learn it. You've got a year to kind of capitalise on it. And you've got the third year to go, all right, I know what I'm doing. They know what I'm doing. They know I'm valuable. What's next? Yeah, it's hundred percent true. You, you try to split every six months somewhere else, and that happens everywhere in every game these days, yeah. because of the way the world is now and the opportunity around companies that aren't long-term manufacturing based, and media and and online companies, and yeah. you know stuff that changes very quickly. So people change very quickly. That's okay too, but there's no there's no 
time to build anything with any depth. Yep. Yeah, I think to your point, you know, you've got to learn it, you've got to do it, you've got to crush it almost yeah. in that third year and then you know, onwards and upwards from there. Hey, look, one thing we're going to do every, um, every episode is have a student of the week question. Oh, yeah? Uh, so the first couple of questions I've got from uh, UOW, and the first one's from Tom, and I think it's a very relevant, uh, almost mm-hmm. tangent to some, to some degree. Um, not saying that you're going anywhere, but Tom's <laughs> asked, what advice would you give to someone who, won, who one day, should I say, wants to be in your shoes? Uh, just everything I've said in the, in the last podcast is just, um, in the rest of the podcast, sorry, is, um, you know, just don't worry too much if you're young, Tom, working out what it is at the moment. You know, you might know tomorrow what you want to be, but you probably don't. And if you work hard and you find the general thing that you're good at, like I said, I'm an ad man, you know, it's a... I like it. I understand it. If you find yourself in that area that you like, stay there and keep working and put some time in and understand everything about it because there's a real self-satisfaction for you in knowing. Sometimes I go, well, I actually know something. I'll surprise (laughs) myself, you know, because you actually don't realise what you know, but you only know those things because you've been doing them a long time and become an expert in it and that's actually that's a as good a good a way as any to have a career right yeah um find something you know find the area that you're interested in yeah push in and and keep working perfect mate well um 17 years strong to date hopefully there's another 17 years at the top you know obviously your your knowledge of rib curl is is um yeah next to next to none really and um Wish you all the best. 20 years we've had a relationship yeah. at least. Um, mentor, yeah. boss, mate, yeah. etc. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks no for worries. being the first Thanks guest for on the me. podcast. Yeah. Um, and rip in this year. Yeah, no worries. Good. Good luck, everybody, in the future.